Hey, I'm Jack Ailey. Thanks for joining us today from the mini studio. And I'm really happy to have our author today, author of Home Buying in 30 Minutes, Jim Morrison. Jim has appeared, his byline, in the Boston Globe, uh, Banker and Tradesman, Forbes.com. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, we're going to talk about home buying in 30 minutes, uh, or, or less, actually. Uh, you can read the book in 30 minutes. Uh, hey, thanks, Jim. Thanks for coming today. Thanks for having me on. Uh, it's, it's our second edition of the MIDI Studio, and we're looking for uh, really interesting people in Boston, and Jim is most certainly interesting with this great new book. I'm really glad that you stopped by. And uh, he's on a book tour, kind of promoting the book, and let's talk about it, Jim. Uh, you come from this, uh, both from some talent fields that you don't usually don't see combined. So that's why I really think that this is super and helpful for consumers, is that Jim is not only a great author, as I mentioned, but also he has a long track record, 20 plus years, as a home inspector. So he's not only seen and written about journalism, uh, real estate from a journalistic perspective, but also seen a lot from a nuts and bolts point of view as a home inspector. So I really think this is a really great combination of professions. And that's why I really believe that this book can help buyers, especially including my buyers and buyers at my agency and, and throughout the state or, or country. So thank you so much for coming today. Oh, really appreciate that's a It's a really unusual combination that you get. So um, <clears throat> let's start off talking a little bit about the type of experts that a home buyer should kind of assemble as a team that are going to help them through this process this is obviously the biggest type of transaction that they're going to be involved with purchasing a home it's right up there you know and who do they kind of need to gather around them to make sure that this goes well well they need a lot of people and it's often i think for people uh if you're buying in a community that you've lived in for a long time or in the in the area you may know an agent or an attorney or a mortgage broker, but many people don't. So in the book I talk about, first of all, if you have, you need somebody, you need a team you can trust. You need people, people, you're, this is a, these are hard waters to navigate. The vocabulary, particularly with mortgages, is very foreign to most of us. Um, so you're going to need a trusted guide, I would say. Uh, if you know a great agent, then I think you could start there. Um, but if you don't know anyone, I suggest people <laughs> I suggest people uh, who aren't lucky enough to know Jack Gailey to I would get find a um, a good attorney, a good real estate attorney, and I think so. Agent that you trust mm -hmm. no, does it matter what agency they work for, or is it more important that you trust them? I would say it, it's more important that you trust them. I think trust. to agents it matters what agency they work at, but you notice a lot of times when agents switch companies. Most of the consumers follow the agent. They don't skip a beat. They move from Acme Company to XYZ Company, and to them that's important, but to the consumer not so much. Right. All right, so agent that you trust, that's critical. Critical. And here in Massachusetts, this is not the case in many states, but Massachusetts, we're an attorney state. Mm -hmm. So uh, the buyer is going to have an attorney, or at most at the least, the lender is going to have an attorney. Right. So... Oftentimes, the lender allows the buyer to choose the attorney. Mm -hmm. In a lot of cases, or they'll have a recommended list or something like that. So, agent, attorney, mm -hmm. and who else? Well, just one more word on attorneys. I think it's really important to have a real estate attorney. I think a lot of people have a, a litigator, uncle or aunt, who's you know willing to help out either for free or a reduced fee. Um, and as I say in the book, there's every real estate agent or every real estate attorney has a story about a deal that almost got blown up because some attorney who's not familiar with the practice of real estate in that area or in general um, will just make a, either slow deals down or sometimes even blow them up. Um, very, very important. I think to have a, a real estate attorney, there's also it's a fields of law. Mm -hmm. And knowing kind of how things go with real estate being critically important, I, I think that's really great advice. If they can, and, and people, are, I think there's a temptation to save money because you're not necessarily required. Just go with Uncle Bob, yeah, because he's going to cut us a deal. This is not a place I would want to save money. I have I've bought and sold several houses, always used an attorney, um, a real estate attorney, and I wouldn't I wouldn't be without one. Even knowing what I know, I just wouldn't be without one. Okay, it's insurance. It's it's not. And what is it that you know? What could go wrong? 
everything could go wrong. I mean, you know, you could r write up an offer in a way that hamstrings you. You could um, agree to things that are really um, unusual or just not standard and not know it. Uh, you don't know what you can negotiate, and you know yourself that every PNS gets amended and adopted and somehow edited for every deal. There's no standard deal. I think that um, one of the big things that I like to do when I complete a deal is for people to look at me and say, oh, Jack, this was an easy one. And I, I, I feel that that's like, that's like a standing ovation for me when I hear that at a, at a closing because that, that means that I know all the things that we kind of negotiate or structurally put ourselves in a position so that it wasn't a problem. Right. And I'm like, when I ever hear that, they kind of feel like they may have over, but, but I realize that. And sometimes you never can really show what you did, what the bad thing that didn't happen. So really good point. You, you don't know the rocks you didn't hit. Yeah, rock, that's a good, I love that analogy. All right. Thanks. Um, so what is the other type of professional that you need? Uh, so you will eventually, uh, I know in, in markets like Boston, it could take a long time, but eventually people do find houses that they want to buy and they will need to then hire a home inspector when, once their offer gets accepted. And, and that's important too, that you find somebody who is not only knowledgeable, but also, uh, knowledgeable for, with some specialties that you might be interested. If you're looking at antique homes, you probably want somebody who's done a lot of work on antique houses. Um, Log cabin home. I mean, there's all sure. sorts of things. Mobile okay. homes. Mobile home. Um, yeah, absolutely. They're they're not. It's not one size fits all. And, but then you got to buy it. So if you're paying cash, you don't need a mortgage person. But right. Oh, the mortgage. That's right. Uh, you're going to need a mortgage, and then that is also important that you shop around. I think the CFPB. Have, oh, first of all, it's important that you find somebody that you trust. So. If you don't know a mortgage, with all of these, yeah, and if you don't know a mortgage person, your attorney or your agent certainly will know somebody in the business that they trust. Or you read, yep, absolutely. I I recommend that people stay away from these online big national lenders uh, with no sort of presence in the community. Uh, those those uh, those lenders are not. I don't want to overstate this, but they they people who don't have a stake in the community really don't have a stake in the community and they're not worried about losing a referrer like you because you're I just did a deal with that like that the buyer and we were calling Illinois or whatever and you could tell it was just a massive company and it's just another deal and there's no they have no hope to get another deal because they're their business is scattered throughout the country right how do you figure out how much to afford and I think that's kind of like a double-edged sword that can be very dangerous. We talked, to, we haven't talked about this, but obviously that's kind of one of the things that led to the financial crisis in 2008 right. is a lot of people are actually buying at the maximum amount they could afford. Mm -hmm. So how do you figure that out? Well, there's a formula and a mortgage broker uh, would go over with consumers, but it's basically, it's about, you know, 30% of your income uh, is about what you can afford to spend on housing. And they want to make sure that your monthly debt isn't more than, I think it's 46%. Jump in if I'm getting that. Yeah, well, it varies, obviously. Yeah, it, it varies a little bit. Lending environment. I think, yeah, you know, everybody wants everybody wants more than they can afford. No matter what your budget is, you want more. If you can My afford. wife's trying to buy a car today, so I know exactly <laughs> what that means. <laughs> no explanation necessary <laughs> then. Uh, so you really have to figure out what you're comfortable spending. Um, a lot of people are familiar with the term house poor. You get all of your money tied up in your housing. You can't afford to maybe make repairs, go on vacation, go out to dinner, get braces for your kids, whatever. Um, on the other hand, you know people's income does go up typically over time. So you know everybody and people are forced to stretch in this market. That was my dad's strategy, and my dad was a banker, and he basically said, Dad, John. John, son, buy the house and you'll figure it out later. And I'm like, he's a banker and this is his strategy, but we did figure it out. Um, if you find a house, nowadays in this competitive market, and this is not only in Massachusetts, but most of the country, mm -hmm. things are very competitive and you might have to get into a bidding war. How do you handle mm -hmm. this as a buyer? Well, again, this is where a trusted agent, I think, comes in uh, critically because... Everyone's different. Every situation is different. I think um, people tend to make emotional decisions at this time, particularly if houses are sold upon emotion. Yeah, typically, of course, right? And and when and the competition adds another, it sort of turns the heat up on that pot. Uh, people don't like to lose. I sort of very, I'm competitive myself. I understand that emotion. Um, 
Uh, and, you know, it really depends on the property, on what things are selling for. That's why I think, you know, picking your team is probably the most critical thing because now you're going to get coaching from your agent who, if they're local, may know the listing agent. They may know the area. There may be, I don't want to say insider knowledge, but additional information. that what, lo- I, what I like to call it, I'm sorry to interrupt, it is nuance, things that you kind of know about. I mean, that mm, somebody just coming in from seven towns away might not know. Right. And there's that local nuance, and that's actually why real estate continues to be a little bit of a local thing. Absolutely. Um, sometimes, in order to make your offer more attractive, not only on the numbers, but you know, there's basically three parts of any offer. It's mm-hmm. the numbers, mm-hmm. the dates, critical, mm-hmm. sometimes uh, you know, not understood that that's so critical, and then the contingencies. Mm-hmm. What are the kind of the basic contingencies and when would a buyer consider waiving those contingencies? So your offer is contingent upon, it can be t- contingent upon a lot of things. Sometimes people make an offer that is contingent on selling their, their own house. Um, or sometimes these, these uh, houses, the offers are accepting contingent on the seller finding somewhere else to live. That's, I think, you'll back me up, it, less common today on the, um, those contingencies. It depends on the... The market, the market is so hot now that when we do see a home sale contingency, the chances that they're going to f- be able to sell that house are pretty good. Oh, right. So two or three years ago, I would have been a lot a more, I was more concerned about that. Hmm. But now it, when I do see them, and they are less common, but when I do see them, I'm not as concerned about them because the chances they're going to sell that other house are, are pretty darn good. Right. right. Uh, so that, that is one, that is, that's an interesting thing. So home sale contingency. More commonly, most people, I think 80% of buyers get a mortgage in this yeah. country. And so most people have a mortgage contingency that says, hey, look, we've been pre-approved, but if we can't get financing by the cert- by a certain date. If something happens, then we want to be able to pull out of the offer and get our deposit back. That's in some markets around here. I know in Cambridge at the heat, of, and things are cooling down a little bit now, but in the heat of the market, that was considered a weak offer. Yeah. A, a mortgage contingency was you know, sort of like a second best offer. Right, especially somebody who's offering cash. And uh, apples to apples, if someone's offering mortgage versus cash, you're going to take the cash deal. Um, sure the... Mortgage can t- the mortgage company can only look at two things. They can look at your ability to pay, you know, your credit, your tax returns, and all those things. They can look at the value of the asset. Mm-hmm. As a general rule of thumb for those new buyers out there, buying a condo or a home is usually about a 45-day process, and you're going to get that final final mortgage commitment at about day 30 in mm-hmm. the process. You know, plus or minus. That's going to vary depending upon how your agent structures the deal. And then, of course, there's the home inspection. You have a lot more experience on that. So tell us about the home inspection. What do you have to look out for as a buyer looking at houses? Just like my wife's buying a car today and, you know, there are some things. I says, when you go out, look for a car, because we're not buying a brand new car. We're going to slightly used car. And, you know, I said, if you see these things, just, you know, get go to the next dealership. So right. what do you really, and you have a lot of experience with this, what, do you, what are the kind of warning signs when you're looking at a property that maybe the buyer can find out or maybe the home inspector finds out later on? All right. Um, so yeah, the, the important things to look for, I'd say very generally, um, if something looks wrong, it probably isn't. It probably is wrong. Like, um, things that you can look for, it's hard, you know, it's, you know, especially with our housing stock being so old in this part of the world, you know, two and 300 year old homes uh, oftentimes, certainly 100 years used to be an old home, now it's, that's like middle aged. Um, I would say uh, cracks in the foundation. An easy an easy rule of thumb is if it's uh, wider than a quarter of an inch, that's something that should be looked at by an engineer. That's a structural thing going that's on. That's very struct. That's some cracking is going to happen in almost any foundation. If it's wider than a quarter of an inch, you need an engineer. Yeah, very common to have like a hairline frac- fracture coming out of like at an angle out mm-hmm. of a window well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. No big deal. And, and it's a sliding scale, I would say, depending on the age of the house and other things. But certainly, I would have an engineer in uh, at a quarter of an inch. Uh, other things um, that are easy to spot, um, there are, it's hard. I think, you know, excessive bouncing, particularly decks. I, f- I used to find a lot of problems with, uh, with decks. People don't understand. They say, well, it's just a deck. You know, you kind of hold it to a lower standard. But... The decks can be dangerous. Decks can be very dangerous. They can be built by the homeowner rather than a contractor. Mm-hmm. Might not be an inspection. Yeah, and they're required to hold um, 
you know, one and a half times the weight of some of the rooms in the house because of things like snow loads and things like people, which, you know, you're not going to have, you know, a lot of people in your bedroom at one time particularly, right? But you might have the whole family on your deck. And that's, you know, if I stand with my feet together, I'm 200 pounds per square foot. That's a lot of weight. And so if you load a deck up... I'm more. <laughs> um, so, and you might have like 30 people out there if it's a high school graduation or something like that. I mean, summer bash, you could have a lot of people out the deck. And that's when, it, you know, connections fail. That's when the lack of a flashing and a little bit of rot will... When you hear about deck collapses, you know, that's typically the scenario. So I would say that is a... Is a big deal to watch out for. Another thing consumer. Oh, were you going to say? No, no, go ahead. Another thing consumers can um, notice is when you're looking at um, plumbing and wiring. If you see price tags on anything, that's generally the sign of homeowner work and not a professional. Okay, good point. All right, that's something that, and which you know, homeowners can do good work too. But it's just something I would pick up on. Now, um, in Massachusetts, the condition statement that the seller has to fill out is optional and in most states it's mandatory right so we are one of the few states where the improved property uh, condition statement you don't have to fill it out and the vast majority of sellers don't fill it out mm. in fact I'll probably tell you I don't think I've ever had a seller fill it out at any one of my listings ever Wow. and it's mandatory in most other states yeah. so especially here in Massachusetts I think the home inspection process is even more important I think so. And the ones that I do see filled out, often there's you know a lot of not applicable or don't know. And sometimes they're even wrong. People just don't know their houses as well as they think they do. How long should a home inspection take for your typical three-bedroom, two-and-a-half bath house? I, w- I would say, you know, give or take. It's a, Again, it's a hard thing to generalize. On the you know Some houses are easy and fast, and some take a lot of thinking and working, and crawl spaces slow you down. But I would say about three hours, roughly, uh, to, to go through a property... Condos probably less, like maybe two, depending on the building. Um, but that's how long. Well, that's how long I used to spend. Okay. Uh, and more if it if it takes longer. Again, we're talking with Jim Morrison, author of Home Buying in Thirty Minutes. Jim, um, sometimes, and a lot of people don't realize that you know when they put in that offer, that might not be the final price. And right. so I want to mm-hmm. just wrap up with this last segment here. Oh, sure. um, a lot of people, you know, if sellers, they, they get that offer and I tell them, you know, don't fall in love with that offer because there's still more one, there's still more one step in this dance here. So, you, you know, you get an offer for whatever it is, 350 and then the home inspection comes. Mm-hmm. How, how does that uh, work? I mean, there's basically a couple of things that could go wrong here or be negotiated still. Right. Uh, this is another. This is a place I used to get cornered a lot uh, as an inspector. Because it's all your fault, Jim. You found these problems. <laughs> and, and then and buyers would say, well, what should I negotiate? And I would always say, you know, that's way above my pay grade. It depends on the market. It depends on the house. Um, people. So if, if, a, if a big issue comes up during the inspection, that is typically negotiable. Um, it, at least you have the opportunity to negotiate. The owner may think you're stealing the house from him at that point price and say you bought it and it, we're not going to budge um so that's the, that's where again the agent uh i think the buyer's agent feels out the listing agent um gets a sense of the condition of the house if the house is old and obviously um looking a little unloved i don't you know, you're probably not going to get very far negotiating tired we say oh, tired, tired. <laughs> we got to have those real estate euphemisms <laughs> that's right um, i always say there's no bad houses there are only bad owners uh, <laughs> <laughs> and are there things that um, you see that typically that the buyer should just like after the home inspection they should just walk other than the foundation crack that you mentioned or is everything fixable everything is fixable I have maybe once or well no more than that a handful of times in 25 years that I ever turn to somebody and say do you really want me to go through okay. this is this is really bad <clears throat> yeah um, people have told me I've seen enough I'm out of here I'm out of here already um, but Virtually everything is fixable. Uh, it's just a matter. It's it's all a matter. What do they say? If you if you price a house any property right, it's it's going to sell. Now a home inspector they work for who? We work for the buyer. To, we work for whoever pays us. Some sometimes sellers will hire a hire a home inspector in advance. In advance, that's unusual, but it's happening. It does happen. Uh, but typically, a home inspector works for the buyer. Issues a report to the buyer only. 
a no, it doesn't give the report to anyone else or discuss it without the buyer's permission. Yeah, so that's happened to me, unfortunately, where, you know, the sometimes the listing agent will come to the home inspection. Mm-hmm. Usually they'll just hang out in the kitchen. Right. Um, but then when the home inspector is done, I've had listing agents kind of barge into that meeting and be like, hey, how'd it go? And, <laughs> and my response is, well, we'll get back to you. Right. You know, and thanks. Thank, well, you can go back to the kitchen now. Right. Uh, so that's really important that the... The seller side should not get the home inspection report, and I think yeah. that a lot of first-time home buyers might not know that. Right. Um, a- occasionally, I might excerpt a sentence yes. or two or a picture to and send that to the list agent, mm-hmm. so that the list agent can use that to inform the seller that oh yeah, you really do have mold in the attic, right. you know, so they don't have to climb up there again to look at it or something like that. That's um, legitimate. I think that's fine as long as the buyer understands you're doing it. For me, at least, home inspection things fall into two categories. Code and safety, which I think should be fixed before you close. Mm-hmm. And then and basically everything else, which is negotiable. Mm-hmm. Um, but if it's a code or safety issue, I think, you know, you got to get that on the day you move in. And that's kind of how I handle it with my clients, at least. I think it termites, <clears throat> termite treatments are a common, that's another one common thing that's almost... Instantly, the seller's responsibility. Radon problems, I think, tend to be. Correct me if I'm wrong, because I, you know, as an inspector, I did my work and got out. I don't. I have no idea what got negotiated most of the time, but it's my feeling that, um, or you know, a big roof job or something like that, the big expensive stuff. But everything else is negotiable. I've seen. I've heard clients tell me um, they've negotiated a really my what I consider a really minor problem um, successfully. So. Yeah, and that's true. You just and, never know. And certainly in this current market, and we'll probably just wrap it up on this, some sellers, and you hinted at this, some sellers are saying, hey, you can go do your home inspection, but don't come back to me with any um, discounts that you want. You, you Through the home inspection, usually the buyer can accept it at their sole discretion. And if you want to go forward with the transaction at the price agreed, great. And if you want to walk, fine, but don't ask me for any more discount. Mm-hmm. That's a really common thing in the marketplace now because there's so because they got 27 people waiting outside to buy this house right another thing when people are you know see having a home inspection contingency can we see it can make your offer be seen as a weak offer so people will say well we're going to have our offer contingent on a home inspection but we're not going to come back and negotiate issues unless it's more than ten thousand dollars or more than some number and that's a way of saying, hey, look, we want an inspection, but we're serious about buying the house. We're not going to nickel and dime you with GFIs or... Right. And that's where the agent and or the attorney can add that extra language into the offer, mm-hmm. or which we actually technically call a contract to purchase. And therefore, your home inspection contingency doesn't look as daunting. Yes. It's not so much of a hurdle. Hey, we're talking with uh, Jim Morrison. Let's see, hold up his... We'll do kind of our best Jimmy Fallon, hold up the book. <laughs> Uh, Jim Morrison, author of Home Buying in 30 Minutes. Thank you so much for coming, Jim. Thanks for Awesome. I'm looking forward to it. And uh, if you haven't had a chance to go out there, Jim, where can we get the book? It's available on Amazon.com. Uh, it's up for pre-order right now on the Kindle, and the hard copy book will be available November 14th. November 14th at Amazon, Home Buying in 30 Minutes. Just type that into Amazon, Jim Morrison. Hey, thanks for watching. I'm Jack Gately, host of the Mini Studio. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.